I V M. Hello and welcome to the Wire Talks. I am Siddharth Bhatia. The general elections are at least three years away, and already the first stirrings. Um, maybe not something really big and formal, but the first stirrings of political activity has already begun. Of course, the state elections uh, were a good indicator where you know voting uh, patterns lie. But uh, as we know, in the past, uh, state elections are not necessarily good indicators of how the national vote would go. Nonetheless, the BJP, which is always in election mode, has started preparing because it also has to now go to elections in the crucial state of UP. And the opposition is trying to see what possibilities exist. To make sense of all this and to analyze what's going on on the political scene, we have with us the eminent political scientist, Dr. Suhas Palchikar. He is an Indian academic and social political scientist. He taught political science at the Savitri Bai Phule University and uh, is a chief editor of the Studies in Indian Politics. He is also co-director of the Lokniti program on comparative democracy in CSDS. Welcome to the Wire Talks, Dr. Palchikar. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Okay, so in your long career as an observer of the political scene and as an analyst, have you, have you seen this unusual, I mean, to my mind, unusual situation, a really very, very strong center, but equally in their own domains, in their own provinces, very strong federal leaders who are not necessarily friendly towards the BJP. I think there was some uh, similar situation on a much lesser scale in uh, under Mr. Vajpayee's rule in 2004, but uh, or even earlier, sorry. But uh, since then, you've not had this kind of situation. If I'm mistaken, I would love to know what you have to say on this. This situation is entirely extraordinary in a sense, but at the same time, we did have strong center, at least formally, when Rajiv Gandhi was around, and that created a lot of problems for the Congress ultimately in 1989. And earlier, when Indira Gandhi was emerging as a very strong central leader, then too, there were strong federal or state level leaders around, and she had a lot of confrontations with them. So yes, while there is a sense of extraordinariness to the situation, there is also a sense of deja vu in the, in the sense that uh, this has been happening, that as the center emerges stronger and stronger, a reaction sets in, at least in some states, and strong state leaders, either from the opposition or from the ruling party itself, emerge, and that, in a sense, uh, adds to the political dynamics. So it's interesting what you say, that when there is a strong center and very, very strong leaders, there is inevitably a, some kind of tension. But more than that, for the center at least, it doesn't end too well. Uh, Rajiv Gandhi found that out to his uh, consternation. If you remember when NTR began coming up and became really strong, and before that too, but uh, his was such an overwhelming vote, and for at least three years, he was stable. But why do you call this extraordinary even then? I call this extraordinary because there is a leader who is now centrally so powerful and so ambitious that we probably haven't had any such powerful and ambitious leader earlier, in spite of the fact that we did have Indira Gandhi. Uh, secondly, it's extraordinary also because it is informed by a certain ideological passion of not only just keeping power intact, but changing the social system and cultural mores of the people. So what we are witnessing is not just power tussle between the center and the states, 
but beneath that we also have this tussle between an ideological passion and an absence of the awareness of that ideological passion on the part of the opponents surely they have seen some of that ideological passion uh, firstly in their own backyards uh, i think uh, mamta banerji felt it the most and um, even after she won the election handsomely uh, there was some move to destabilize her so i think maybe they have recognized also as i was saying this central government the bjp mr modi personally along with mr shah are uh, constantly in election mode and they want to expand so that lays the ground for some kind of conflict which we are already seeing right so so do you think that can only get worse in the next three years in all probability yes because as you rightly pointed out uh, the bjp has not taken kindly to the election results of west bengal and that is an indication of the things to come uh, there is also a possibility of a confrontation on a different ground altogether in tamil nadu and therefore i think both tamil nadu and west bengal will be in the forefront of this confrontation with the government of india or the union government so to say once they are there i think the others would start gravitating towards it because one day or the other the other state parties are going to realize that the confrontation is not just because of they are in power in the state but there are larger stakes involved such as as such as it's not just the state finances the larger stakes are not just about the state finances but the very existence of state parties in their respective states because in the ultimate game plan that we see in this extraordinary situation it can only be at the peril of the state parties that the bjp can actually remain safe as a powerful center it's interesting that you should also say that the larger stakes uh, go beyond finances um, i mean there is now a widespread impression that uh, the bjp uh, is very keen to capture critical state assemblies perhaps all important state uh, state assemblies and uh, that's working towards an ideological objective and that's working towards the concept i think of total control yes. and i think uh, that is something that uh, will really worry uh, all these state governments who are going to say that they don't want to simply win the election they want to perhaps annihilate us so um, and the congress has already felt that the congress uh, mukt bharat i mean they have not actually said mamta book uh, west bengal but that is the entire thing so what is this thing that's driving the bjp so much i think apart from the fact that they have this new leader in the person of mr modi and apart from the fact that there is this constant election mode as you pointed out at the beginning uh, 100 years after the rss came into being i think they are pretty close now to actually engaging more proactively with their original project and that original project is to actually wipe out the legacy of the nationalist movement to wipe out the idea that gandhi and nehru sort of not only propagated but practiced in the form of uh, this extraordinary experiment of having indian democracy not only tolerate but exist within diversity this coexistence of diversity and democracy was an extraordinary project which is an anathema and therefore it is not just powerless but it is the idea of homogenizing everything that drives at least the core of the bjp there might of course be many other those who have joined the bjp for power and there will always be layers within the party but i think the core is driven by this for the first time possibility of expanding their ambition and realizing it and uh, one of the one of the uh, weapons in their armory will be to Um, have enough rajya sabha seats to 
change the constitution. Yes, state power is really the weapon. And then after that, uh, changing the constitution would probably um, lead to not just wiping out the nationalist project, which is, of course, one of their reasons why they run down Nehru so much, though they are a little less angry or a uh, you know, little more diplomatic about Gandhi. But that then will establish the mono uh, cultural, monolithical view, worldview. So it is moving towards that. And the state elections are a weapon in that direction, right? Yes, I would say so. Though I don't think they would in the next at least five years or so uh, get into this business of amending the constitution much. They would have, of course, ingenious ways of changing the constitution, like they have done with the Article 370 already. But otherwise, I think they would have more sophisticated ways of changing the situation, which is to change the public opinion in such a fashion that the constitutional provisions uh, of a certain kind, protecting diversity, become practically redundant. So therefore, in spirit, if not letter, yeah. and keeping the public... Uh, now, there is no particular survey in that direction, so one must be careful, and there is no scientific proof but one gets the sense that there is a reasonable body of opinion which says that democracy is an inconvenience and we should dis uh, we should uh, keep it aside. I won't say discard it, but keep it aside because what this country needs is discipline. There has always been that yearning in India. Uh, yes, yeah, that you mentioned this fact that there is not enough survey evidence, which is true. So we shouldn't be making overstatements. But it is also true that whatever survey evidence we have shows that what one would call as strong Democrats are always limited in numbers. And weak Democrats are larger in numbers. So where they veer around, which direction the weak Democrats go, is really going to be a crucial question for India in the coming decade or so. It's not just something happening in one year or two years. But uh, the Lokmiti surveys over the last 10, 20 years show that the proportion of strong Democrats is limited. And that is why we always find that whenever the government clamps down on opposition, political opposition, so to say, there isn't much traction to that in terms of opposition to it. The best way actually it was put was too much democracy. That is how Indians generally feel that democracy is a great thing, but let us not have too much democracy. And that is the dividing line. Where that too much democracy is, is the dividing line. So yes, there is not much survey evidence, but there is enough survey evidence to caution that this might actually unfold over a decade or so. And of course, uh, there is uh, institutional support because such uh, sentiments have been expressed in the highest court in the land. Absolutely. And uh, quite honestly, one would say, I would say at least as a personal uh, opinion, this is, this is a frightening prospect. And uh, I mean, one has always felt that during the emergency, if you recall, there were a lot of people saying this discipline is important and they supported her. Yes, yes. And they supported the suspension of rights. So what can possibly inhibit their progress? Because these state governments, however powerful they are, Mamta Banerjee, M.K. Stalin, even I would say up to a point, you know, people like Amrinder Singh, for the moment at least, they have zero influence beyond their border. Right. Pinarai in Kerala, who's doing a, uh, supposedly doing a good job, they have very, very limited influence outside this. So what are the factors that can possibly inhibit this march towards um, total control? I think the first step still would be that all these leaders have continuous conversations among them, which doesn't happen currently. Uh, unless they realize 
how situations in each other's states are equally problematic and therefore dangerous, I don't think they would come uh, across this possibility of what is called the grand coalition or a non-BJP forum, etc. So that conversation has to continue. You are right, they don't have influence beyond their states. Not only influence, they, many of them wouldn't be even known beyond their states or outside of their states. And uh, that is why we will have to wait for a moment when in the final instance, each leader at the state level pitches in and at the state level keeps the BJP under control. That's the only route. I don't see any All India leader suddenly emerging to counter the BJP at the All India level. Palchikar, uh, past experience, and I'm thinking in terms of uh, not just the Janta Party, not that far back, but, um, you know, people like uh, Devagoda or people like accidental chief minister like Devagoda and Mr. I.K. Gujral soon after, and many other attempts to have a third front have really uh, not lasted beyond a point. And uh, it's fine to say that there was a strong opposition and there were Congress was very, very strong, but uh, they fell under the weight of their own ambitions and their contradictions. So what is the chance they can emerge as a cohesive unit? Again, I would agree with you that that chance is very slim. And that is why I have always felt over the last five, seven years since the BJP emerged as the dominant party that uh, the only way this can be countered would be for the opposition also to have an anchor, uh, which is multi-state, if not all India. Uh, only with a multi-state anchor, uh, this kind of opposition unity can have a political traction and some durability. I would still not guarantee that it would be durable uh, beyond a limit. It's possible. I'm going to touch upon this recent meeting between uh, which brought some opposition leaders together which they were trying to uh, tie themselves in not trying to say it's not this it's not a front it's not and i sense that that's perhaps for a they didn't get all the people b more important Many of those very parties may be keeping their options open? Not really, because for many of them now, it is clear that uh, aligning with the BJP is going to be suicidal. Uh, the way one by one various parties of at the state level have uh, severed their links with the BJP, uh, it seems to me that they are very cautious and wary of the BJP, though not hopeful of a non-BJP front. So at the moment, I think there is this kind of uncertainty. They would buy peace with the BJP, like parties in Andhra and Telangana have currently done. But when the moment comes, I'm sure they will put their weight behind this non-BJP forum, front or alliance, whatever they call it. You're right that uh, these uh, parties in uh, all over the country have figured out that uh, the BJP, once it has you on their side, it does not give you much quarter, much freedom, much maneuvering room. And in fact, uh, the Mr. Nitish Kumar has held his own, but he found that out. And um, the Akali Dal is another example. But even then, suppose some parties, and I'm going to name one or two, Suppose some parties re uh, realize that, you know, it's a choice between the devil and the deep, deep sea. Um, say Mr. Sharad Pawar, for example, who may have his own ambitions. Uh, similarly, the Shiv Sena. Or uh, in the past, Mamta Banerjee and the DMK have been part of the Pachpai Alliance. So at the moment, when they understand that there is no national leader and suppose they pull off some kind of miracle, I mean, far-fetched, but suppose they do, I mean, it will not lead to a very, very smooth transition. So uh, they, are, they are really caught in this bind. I understand. And yes, it's a very 
complicated situation, not so easy even for those who are practicing politics currently. Uh, but I think, yes, two things. One is that something very interesting is happening, which is that in every state, you have a large state party and then there are smaller state parties. And the current game plan for the BJP would be to collect all these smaller state parties together because they don't have much stakes in this non-BJP alliance formula. They can get whatever they want from the BJP today and right away. Whereas for the state parties who have long-term stakes, uh, they have learned it the hard way to keep their distance from the BJP at least now. You mentioned Bajpayee, but Bajpayee's time BJP was a different BJP from what it is today in terms of the power it holds. And therefore, it is unlikely that larger state parties would easily make peace with the BJP. And that is why we are finding so many ways of them talking to each other, finding out, and at the moment it is groping in the dark really, to find out what possibilities there can be 2020 onwards, uh, 2022 onwards really. Uh, I think they will not do anything until the UP elections are over. The UP elections will be critical not only for the BJP but also for the opposition. Uh, and only then probably a reconfiguration of opposition would start happening. The UP elections is a very, very, it's always very interesting. But this time is extremely interesting because the last time the BJP won really well, very, very good majority. Then uh, suddenly out of the blue pulled out a leader and put him on top uh, who was not even a member of the party. He is a member of his, he was the chief of his own organization. And uh, there's a lot of speculation. He may have blackmailed them. He may have threatened them. Quite honestly, he has turned out to be an unmitigated disaster. And the BJP, for all its passion and uh, ideological drive, cannot tolerate this level of defiance and incompetence. So this time round, he is not going to give in. As uh, we understand, he has uh, held his ground. And uh, the BJP may go into it a bit nervous, wouldn't you say? Surely. I mean, it's bad politics to rely on the factionalism within the BJP for its defeat. But at the same time, politics are ironical sometimes. And uh, what Modi did to Advani and the BJP generally, uh, Mr. Adityanath might be doing later on in the future to Modi and Shah and the BJP more generally. Uh, these are leaders who are in a sense self-made. Uh, we talk of their connection with the RSS on the one hand and with the BJP on the other hand, which there would be. But at the same time, like Modi, Mr. Adityanath would have his own agenda laid out for the next 10 years. And that, that would be a fascinating politics in spite of the fact that, as I said, uh, opposition politics should not rely on factionalism within the BJP. I think that is something very interesting which is likely to happen even if we assume that much of what is being talked about is media gossip. Let us grant that. And even then, I think this is going to happen. And that is something which any student of politics would be looking forward to as a lesson to understand how parties are made and unmade. So what you say is truly astonishing that, though, of course, people have talked about it. This is in stark terms that uh, Yogi Adityanath will do to Mr. Modi and Mr. Shah, what uh, they did to Mr. Advani. Uh, we should not forget that Mr. Modi is aging and uh, Adityanath has some way to go. Plus, I am, as an aside, I am waiting for Mr. Modi to remind of Raj Dharma to Mr. Adityanath. <laughs> he may have quietly behind the scenes, uh, but uh, this time he has had to retreat. And uh, the state uh, BJP chief said, well, he's not being replaced. So there are straws in the wind of where Adityanath uh, thinks his strength is. His strength primarily lies in the fact that not just his own organization and followers, and not only the fact that he's the leader of the NAT, but also 
his strength lies in the fact that he may have huge support in Uttar Pradesh itself. Because ultimately, the things that a true blue BJP supporter looks for is where does this leader stand in terms of the minority communities? Yes. And whether or not this leader is not racked with doubt. Mr. Yogi Adityanath is not inhibited by what the world thinks of him. Mr. Modi does have that slight uh, apprehension. And maybe Mr. Shah too along with him. But Mr. Adityanath just doesn't care. And that couldn't care attitude that he has got one big agenda and goal and he's pursuing it, that could be the tipping factor, I think. And I'd like to know your views on that. Yes, it could be a tipping factor for the time being. But as I said, both the BJP and the RSS have this uh, flexibility of adapting to this situation, just as the RSS sort of adapted to Mr. Modi though there was no love lost between the two previously when he was the chief minister of Gujarat, I think there would be various considerations involved in this. One of the considerations would be the possibility of Adityanath having a following and popularity outside of UP as well. Uh, the other scenario on the other hand, and that is very dangerous for UP politics and Indian politics generally, is this juxtaposition of an OBC force versus a non-OBC force within the BJP. Should that latter scenario unfold, I think there will be some more churning that we might witness. If the former, that is to say the Adityanath popularity across and outside of UP prevails, then probably the worst case scenario might unfold where you have a leader who is unencumbered by this uh, media image issue you know, who is unencumbered by the even fig leaf of constitutional propriety, etc. And therefore, many more things can happen in that year. So that's going to be a fascinating election by itself. And uh, should uh, the BJP come back, even with a truncated uh, majority, uh, is going to lead to, you know, some kind of ripple effect. In fact, more than a ripple. Yes. And that will demand a close observation. Um, UP always does, but this time it will really be, we need to observe it. Don't forget, uh, let's not forget that uh, UP has given many chief ministers in the past and uh, Yogi Adityanath may think that uh, time we reverted to that. So we shall uh, continue to watch that. Now, I wanted to ask you a specific question about Maharashtra because you are a keen observer of what the Maharashtra situation is. What do you think is going on in the minds of the leaders of the MBA at this very moment? They've lasted close to two years, but does it mean that it has the cohesiveness to last longer given that Temptations are always there and they are being dangled by the BJP. Meanwhile, in the last six months, as you have seen, the, the BJP has tried various methods. But now, maybe with the, after all that, it could be the carrot approach. So how do you see that? I would still think that much would depend on the overall All India scenario. Uh, if the possibilities of various equations among non-BJP parties get consolidated, then MBA remains more or less safe in the state. If they don't, then there would be internal contradictions which will bring it down. I don't think the Congress or the NCP would immediately join a BJP-led government and therefore it would be more a chaotic situation rather than coming back of the BJP. Though I am aware that the BJP in Maharashtra needs only a handful of MLAs to come back to power. It doesn't really need a coalition with any of these three parties. If enough number of MLAs are ready to defect, as they did in Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka, then the BJP would be too happy to do that. And therefore, the scenario that I can imagine is not really one of the three parties switching over to the BJP, but large-scale defections 
effected through various measures by the BJP. If that doesn't happen till the UP elections, then I think they are through for a longer duration. Yeah, so it's basically uh, trying to bring in the rank and file rather than the leadership. Right. I think uh, all of us who have seen Maharashtra politics one way or the other is uh, are going to continue watching it very, very closely. Now, Dr. Palchikar, which in a sense leads me to the crucial question that we've talked about the state leaders, we've talked about Maharashtra and uh, so many other uh, permutation and combination, but why does the BJP still worry about the Congress with its pathetic 44 in Parliament, as well as governments like, uh, say, for example, in Madhya Pradesh, which uh, fell, coalition governments in Karnataka, where the Congress was a constituent, fell. Rajasthan, it came to the wire, but pulled back. Yet, it seems like almost a Twitter campaign to go after the Congress. What is it about the Congress that worries the BJP, if at all? I think politically, the reason why the BJP is always obsessed or worried about the Congress is because it is in the three, four crucial states where there is a straight fight between the BJP and the Congress. And if the Congress were to do a little better in those states, uh, this current dominance of the BJP would suddenly come down. You take Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra also included in a sense, Chhattisgarh and Rajasthan. If the Congress does well in these four, five states and Karnataka perhaps, then there is a big problem on hands for the BJP. That's one. The second political reason is ultimately the BJP, Congress is the only, as I said earlier, multi-state party which can provide an anchor to a non-BJP coalition, and that is the other political worry. The third political worry is, while everyone seems to be ridiculing the Congress leadership, and particularly Mr. Rahul Gandhi, one never knows if he emerges as a popular leader. And if that were to happen, then there would be a direct confrontation in terms of image and personality, which the BJP today doesn't want, because as you pointed out, Modi is growing old. He's already now in power for 10 years by the time the elections take place. And a fresh new leadership from an opposition can always be a danger. So these are the three political reasons. Obviously, I need not repeat the fourth non-political or larger political reason, which is ideological. That after all, it is the mental burden on the BJP that the Congress is responsible for whatever has happened, not only just last seven decades, but for 100 years. The hatred of the kind of Gandhi Nehru type of politics that the BJP core has always cultivated is today, uh, in a sense, imposed upon the Congress. You and I might say that today's Congress is third rate. It is not the Nehru Congress, etc., etc. But in public mind and in the mind of the core of the BJP, it is in that ideological battle where the Congress is the enemy because Congress represents, in a sense, what a possible Stalin might do, what a possible Mamata might do, or what a possible Sharad Power might do. For the BJP, therefore, all these state leaders, in a sense, are offshoots of Congress type of politics. So there is an ideological reason also behind their constant wariness about the possibility of a Congress revival. Uh, after all, the Congress has won, even in its worst situation, 20, 21, 22 percent of the vote this time. I think slightly higher the last time, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Just a little bit, but yes. Yeah, yeah. So therefore, that 20 percent still believes in the Congress. And uh, if we were to look at some kind of you know, rural urban divide or a divide in terms of Hindi belt and other places or whatever, they all are not open to 100 percent scrutiny. But in these states and among the rural folk, 
uh, there is still some uh, regard for the Congress. Whether this will last another 5, 10, 15 years, we don't know. But I have uh, seen, as you must have seen, that uh, Rahul Gandhi and uh, his uh, sister, he more than she, do pull in audiences, do pull in crowds. He still has followers. And I have come across educated urban folk who say that they are with the Congress and not with the BJP. Primarily also because they cannot stand the BJP's divisive politics and they think that the Congress still has some measure of that dreaded word, secularism. So I think that's a very, very sharp analysis to say that it could still form the core of some kind of future revival. And uh, no reason why it can't. The Gandhis, let's say, at the end of the day, are the glue that holds the Congress together, despite the state leaders. So do you think the Congress will be willing, if invited, to join uh, such a coalition? I think mean, that is where the problem of the Congress lies, that it still believes that it is the natural leader of any non-BJP government. The moment the Congress is willing to give up that illusion and send a message that we are willing to just be together, I think things would smoothen themselves. That is not happening at the All India level. And also, of course, the Congress governments are not running well in almost all the places. And therefore, Congress has internal problems of its own. But otherwise, I think if the Congress were to give up this ambition of being a natural leader of the opposition and wait and watch the situation and seize opportunities as and when they come by, then probably a better conversation between the Congress and other non-BJP parties can resume. But it has happened in places like Karnataka and uh, Maharashtra. It has happened in Maharashtra at least. Karnataka, they couldn't do it properly, but yes, it did happen in Karnataka as well. And that is where the problem of what is called the Gandhi family uh, comes into the picture. Because at the All India level, such a kind of conciliatory position would mean to give up temporarily the ambition of a Gandhi person leading the government or the party as a matter of guarantee. So... Never a good idea to ask a political scientist to see as a crystal ball and how things evolve because uh, the journalists have no such inhibitions, quite honestly. We are very confident of our prediction, which often go wrong. But how do you see some sort of... I know you said the UP elections and the results of the UP election are going to be a marker but and a, uh, and a watershed, but how do you see independently various scenarios emerge? One which is probably the most likely scenario and which many uh, won't like and you certainly wouldn't like to hear about is with a reduced majority and with a lot of factionalism, an ordinary Modi government comes back to power in 2024. That is one very easy scenario, easy in the sense, easy to predict scenario. The complicated scenarios would, of course, obviously be that the economy doesn't pick up, but at the same time, the opposition and their governments at the state level try to do their best at the state level, which then opens the door just a toehold or a foothold for the opposition to make 2024 a contest rather than a foregone conclusion. Uh, that is where I would stop. I wouldn't go beyond that because at the moment I can't really see a grand possibility of suddenly an anti-BJP wave uh, sort of sweeping the country for whatever reason, not at the moment at least. Because such things happen only in the proximity of election. So we might be uh, talking more about it, not after UP, but just nearer 2024. I'm reminded of 1971, when uh, a shaky Mrs. Gandhi, 
who was under assault from her own inner party leadership and she had just split the party yes and then of course there were uh, the opposition parties at that time were weak but still there was almost a given or almost predictions that mrs gandhi would have a tough time and she showed because that was the big post break election for her and she proved not only was she the most popular leader but she also proved that she was the congress this is not the same scenario but and the economy was very poor at that time if i remember correctly speaking of a weak economy and possibly getting weaker what we see right in front of us is a very very weak economy uh, job losses are at record levels second uh, the handling of covid third on the foreign policy and the strategic front uh, we have really there is no other way to put it bluntly speaking we have lost to china uh, in terms of perception and reality because we have given up land and uh, on several other fronts you know neighbors are not happy etc etc and the world i think has figured out that mr modi is weak in terms of options yet there is on the face of it is uh, followers hardcore and you know fan sitters stay with him media i will not go into because the media creates perceptions and the media in india i wouldn't rely on it most of the mainstream media so what explains this level of otherwise by now people would have been out on the streets with the prices and everything people have lost relatives because of mishandling lack of hospital beds what explains this I'll call it apathy or call it uh, uh, hope what explains this i think partly we need to understand and admit that the kind of expectation and hope that modi was able to create so far has not entirely disappeared and therefore people are still willing to say that yes things are bad but he has done the best that he could do assessments can be different but at least this sentiment uh, would still be at the subterranean level somewhere in existence today the second thing i think which is critical is that modi has actually changed the paradigm of electoral politics entirely just as indira gandhi did to an extent in 1971 as you mentioned which is to say that today politics and winning elections is critically based on optics and perception rather than reality and actual sufferings so it is not my actual suffering but the perception that something is likely to happen in the future which is good for me might drive voters still towards the bjp and that paradigm of politics which is constituted by optics and perceptions is something which only someone like mamata banerjee in west bengal could counter so far efficiently unless that is done at the all india level unless opposition parties and congress in particular finds a way to counter that optics and perception not by facts not by tweets but by actually creating a counter optic and a counter perception i don't think things would really start changing drastically yet uh, while you say that and i think there is it's largely uh, largely uh, true let's take for example mr rahul gandhi who has constantly spoken of in recent months about the failures of a warning about covid coming spoken of the failures of uh, mr modi's uh, i'm leaving his tweets aside for the time being but he has made statements they they have held press conferences and yet he is one man i know mamta did it mamta banerji did it i find even samna occasionally criticizing him which is pretty surprising why does it not 
get a wider kind of play? Is that purely because he's not taken seriously or purely because he's, uh, you know, he's been ridiculed so much and, uh, or the media just doesn't give enough uh, space uh, like they used to. Uh, the last three years of uh, the Manmohan Singh UPA government was, uh, I mean, even the smallest infraction, real or imagined, used to get front page. So what is it now? As you said, much can be said about the way the media, particularly the Indian language media, presents Modi and the others. Yes. But at the same time, I think two things need to be remembered. One is the record of the Congress governments in different states is not something that the Congress can really boast, take outside and tell people, look, this is what we have done. So we are still in the reckoning. That's one thing. The other thing is that the location of Rahul Gandhi is still enigmatic to say the least. Yes, Rahul Gandhi says so many things, does so many things, but technically speaking, who is he today? Is he the leader of the party? And what level of leadership is he enjoying currently? We just don't know, nor do Congress persons themselves know. So that is something where this image building process stops because you have an MP from Kerala probably acting as the leader of the entire party. And the location and locational enigmatic uh, situation means that he is not taken seriously. But at the same time, giving all credit to uh, Rahul Gandhi, I would still say that he stops actually short of actual politics, often. I mean, there were opportunities for him during the migrant crisis when he was actually on the streets and for Priyanka Gandhi as well to force a situation on the Modi government which is very willing to use the stick and unless the sticks were used, unless penalties were used against top leaders of the Congress party, the Congress cadres would never be galvanized enough, nor would there be confidence among the ordinary citizens that what Rahul Gandhi is saying in his press conferences, he means it. So that is where sort of his politics stop short. But I, I don't think I need to say this because everyone is, has been saying this one way or the other. And it is easier to preach a politician uh, rather than to observe a politician and understand what he or she is doing. In fact, uh, at that time, if you recall, no other Congress leader of any stage yes. has came out on the street. And uh, today, the Congress has a lot of what I call non-election winners um, and uh, intellectual wonders who have yes. no touch with the mass base. And uh, even those who have the mass base have turned out to be um, so distant. Um, so I think uh, that is uh, definitely the Congress's problem. It's uh, Rahul Gandhi is definitely the face, but he does not have that kind of support which understands uh, that the street still continues to be important. Keeping in touch with your constituents still continues to be important. Uh, a lot of the privileged bunch there thinks is their matter of right to get seats to contest the Lok Sabha. So I think that changed character of the Congress is definitely having an impact. So I think we watch the next one year very, very carefully. And then perhaps I think these outside factors that you brought in, like the economy, do will kind of play some kind of role. But the BJP cannot afford to be sanguine. Sure. Because there are inner pulls and pressures that will register themselves. Mr. Modi is no longer the confident supreme leader with no challenge. Now there are, there is at least one, there may be more. So on that note, Dr. Palchikar, um, this was truly a very penetrating analysis of what's happening in India. 
and uh, what could uh, what could be the scenarios uh, emerging my only regret is that uh, or my only concern is rather that uh, in all this the indians may not come out winners and the citizens may not come out winners because nobody wants a turmoil of any kind so thank you very much dr palchikar uh, on that note uh, we will end this interview uh, that was dr swas palchikar a uh, political scientist with great experience and insight into indian politics for 40 years thank you uh, we'll be back again with another episode of the wire talks next week you can check out this podcast and other interesting ones on the wire website the ivm podcast website app or wherever else that you get your podcasts goodbye from me siddharth bhatia and the wire talks podcast team i hope you enjoyed that show if you aren't following us on social media please do we're ivm podcast on twitter facebook and instagram i'd like to thank the sponsors on the network this week cet cred and global victoria we thank you so much for making all of this possible so this week on cyrus says tapsi panu was recently featured in the netflix original haseen dilruba was on they discussed her experiences in bollywood and a whole lot more on begin the journey ashish vidyarthi enlightens us with his wisdom on how one can get freedom from their own thoughts or insecurities when they communicate with others On the millennial athlete Tanvi and Shlok fill us in on all the drama from the world of sports with Wimbledon Euros and World Test cricket making headlines every day. On Postcards from Nowhere, Utsav Mamoria kicks off a new series beneath the veneer. We travel to the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan where he takes us through his first experience of encountering the Red Sea. We have a brand new show, Misconduct. It's a true crime show hosted by Raghvi, a lawyer, and Nisha, a PR pro. They tell us about the story of Cyanide Malika, the lady who offered cyanide-laden sweets to women and after they died, loot their gold. On the Global Victoria Tech Talks podcast, we showcase some compelling new tech stories coming out of Melbourne. On one episode, Pawan Srinath speaks to Joe Egan from Nelnet International, where they discuss how the pandemic has affected the edtech sector and its evolution. Another episode has Varun Dhirala talking to Ross Simons from Big Ant Studios about the gaming ecosystem and how they envision translating a sport to a game. And with that, I hope to see you again next week. Peshe khidmat hai aapki shaan mein hamare anjuman se. Hi, I am Sadaf and I'm Arshit. Khane ka itihas, economics, policy, psychology, sab hai menu pe. Only on the Naan Kali podcast every Wednesday, sirf IVM podcast app ya website par ya fir jahan se bhi aap apne podcast sunte ho.